Hey Eurovision fam, it's Alicia Michelle and welcome to another Eurovision for real podcast. This is the podcast that talks about all things Eurovision and over here we keeps it real, okay? Some people might call it brutal honesty, some people might call it harsh. I call it realistic and keep it at real, okay? <laughs> Today is going to be a really exciting episode because we're going to be talking about kind of the genre makeup of all the entries that we have this year because I feel like every year at Eurovision, we do find ourselves with patterns. I felt like last year was definitely our battle of the bands. This year, we're not so much having a battle of the bands at all, you know, so it's interesting. And it doesn't necessarily mean just because you have a whole bunch of one genre, it's instantly going to win or anything. But I also think conversely, just like sitting on a plane, like having one song in that genre instantly makes you a winner. I, I, I don't think it's as simple as that. But it's always interesting to see kind of what we have, because I do think this can play a role when folks at home are deciding, you know, who they're going to vote for. Yeah, I'm excited to get in this conversation. I'm not alone today, and we're going to get into it. Your vision for real with Alicia Michelle. <laughs> Yes, with Alicia Michelle, but not alone. Oh, 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 we're playing playing the theme again. You know, we just, I, I, I love a theme song. Everyone knows I love a theme song. I love bed music. I don't know. Maybe I need to, I need to probably hit that funky bed music. You know, just give us something, you know, to keep us motivated in the background. But yes, this is the Eurovision for Real podcast with Alicia Michelle, and I'm not alone today. I am joined by Eurovisionfam.com's. Can I call you the head writer, Elda? Yeah. Because <laughs> I see Elda as our head writer. If we're, if we're sitting down and it's like the editorial stuff, I'm like, okay, Elda, what do you have? What do you have for me? I have to ask Elda, what do you love writing about the most when it comes to Eurovision? Interestingly, I love to see how Eurovision connects with politics in the real world because Eurovision doesn't necessarily occur in a vacuum. It's a really yeah. fun place to be, especially with all the different cultures together, different mm -hmm. types of music. But at the same time, we're working with different countries and that's inherently political. Yeah. I also, I also love interviewing people and that's kind of fun when we get them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, one thing that makes Eurovision fam unique, you know, we recognize that we're coming from the non-participating countries, okay? That's our perspective. We we recognize that we're a guest in the space. So, you know, we're not coming up in people's houses and trying to knock over their plants, okay? We're going to take our shoes off at the door and try and treat the space with respect, but I do think it gives us an interesting perch as well because I wouldn't say that any of us on the team have like you know, real ties to like European countries in a, in, in a sense that might make us a little bit biased. I do think over on our channel, we can kind of look at every country fresh every year. And I, I think that that's what makes, for me, following Eurovision fun and exciting because I love it when people try to shout out and say, oh, Alicia, you always hate this country song because it's literally not true. There is not one country at Eurovision where you can say, I consistently don't like their songs. And that is the beauty of Eurovision. Elda, you want to tell folks where you're from? You have to tell people your background a little bit. I think people are sick of hearing about mine, maybe. Hello, everyone. I'm from the United States, specifically the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, Washington. I'm a graduate of international studies and a constant writer. I about yeah. Yeah, no, Elda, Elda is like, like, I, I know if I have like an article idea, like when one comes to me and I'm like, okay, like I could write this, but like Elda will do it better. So <laughs> I'm just gonna go like send the email of like, hey, do you, do you have a perspective of this? And so we decided to talk about like the genre diversity and or homogeny this year. Elda, I'm just going to pass the mic to you. What are your thoughts this year on kind of what we're getting sonically at Eurovision? My first impression is that it's a really upbeat year. As a, there's very minimal slow tempoed songs, or at least a balladry. If you consider, if you think about songs in Eurovision this year, it's pretty divided something more energetic and more fun. We've also seen a little more of a traditional side, not full-on folk music, 
the jackal comes close, but more traditional elements incorporated into the songs. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I do feel like this year feels a little bit more ethnic. It's definitely an upbeat year. I think without a doubt, this year is upbeat because if we're thinking about like the ballads, like the straight up ballads we have this year, even a lot of those I would classify as like power ballads as opposed to like, you know, an Amar Pelosh That to me is like your traditional ballad. I don't think there's anything power ballad about it. But like, I think if we're thinking about ballads, we're thinking about France. I I think we're thinking about what else is a ballad? I would say, you know, Serbia a little bit is a ballad. Portugal power ballad but i think we could put it in that category latvia's song is a ballad power ballad but a ballad and i don't know some people are kind of putting germany's in the ballad but it's too much of like rag and bone man downbeat to me to be a ballad like i don't i'm not classifying that as a elda how are you breaking down at least the ballads are more slow tempoed tracks that we have this year Mona Moore and Hollow are ballads for sure. Mona Moore is more classical sounding. It really conveys a very particular mood. And Silvani delivers it accordingly. And Hollow is definitely gospel influence. It's definitely more severe. And Ramonda and Grita are definitely slow tempoed. And, but they convey different moods. With Ramonda, there's sort of a fatalism towards it but try to have a little bit of hope in the end. Whereas Greedo has a bit more grandeur in how it builds and Yolanda's voice keeps up accordingly. I've also heard before the party's over being classified as a ballad, but that's a bit more ambiguous because it's not terribly slow. It also has electronic elements. And there's also the very end where it sort of builds up into a chorus of people singing and strings yeah i i think if we're gonna have to consider belgium a ballad then to me like it raises a question with like well then what about switzerland because even though yeah we have the welcome to the show like to me it's a little bit too elect like belgium a little bit too electro a little bit too rousing anthemic almost pulling on rock elements at the end of Belgium's track. I don't know. What what are you thinking? It's a bit too on the edge to be considered a proper ballad. It's more mid tempo. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think I'm with you on that. Okay, but then conversely, let's talk about the songs. Like I mean, I think without any kind of categorization, I mean, we're in agreement that this year is an up tempo year. But with that said, I kind of want to start off with maybe, let's talk about the pop category. Like, what songs do you feel like very, like, standard pop? And I'm not saying standard in a negative. I'm just saying standard in, like, you know, straightforward, this is pop. One song that keeps in mind is Cypress's Liar. It's more of a dance pop song in which Celia will probably have a great choreo in the live, but you definitely get the more upbeat elements towards it, and it's very standard. Sand from Denmark is a little bit different. It's, ve it's very much electronic pop music with very rousing vocals, but it's well-produced and it's well-handled. There's, there's also Georgia, which is pretty surprising because Georgia tends to bring up something different. It's definitely a dance pop with some interesting lyrics, but they tend to make it their own way. Yeah, I think I would add on, in talking about kind of the pop elements, I sort of feel like, I mean, Austria's song, to me, very clear pop entry like just like very standard yes a little bit euro dance but i do think like pure pop perfection and of course if we're talking pure pop perfection we got to talk about sweden this to me is very like yes it's a little bit electro but to me this is 
pop. Like there's there's nothing really like maybe ethnic in it that could kind of maybe pull it in another direction. Like it just feels like a very standard pop track. Um, I think even Iceland a little bit. It's I wouldn't say that Iceland's giving us kind of current pop, but I do think that this is like a straight up pop song. Um, but like as we're kind of talking about this, I also think there's the categories uh, and kind of talking about like Luxembourg and Italy. These songs I kind of put together a little bit because they both have sort of like that ethnic flair. They both sort of give that like warm weather, summery kind of feeling. And it's like the sass, even if you didn't have a vocal on the song, the sass is like baked into even like the instrumentation of the song. What do you think, Elda? It's interesting you mentioned both because both Fighter and Lanoia are co-written by the same songwriter, Dardust. And you could definitely see his influences there with the more traditional elements incorporated in the instrumental. Though so it's not necessarily the same thing as with, say, if something's great, or for example. With Fighter, it's definitely more of a dance pop, but it's very energetic and whatnot. But with La Noia, it definitely has more R&B and more hip-hop influences. So there's that. Yeah, I mean, I think in the battle between Luxembourg and Italy, Italy's probably edging this one out. But I am living in a world where I could see both of them in the final. So I am kind of curious to see if the juries in Televote will be consistent in how they treat the songs or if there might be a little bit of a split. I wanted to kind of begin talking also to about Albania because Albania's song, when we first heard it, I was kind of putting that in like a little bit of like a rhythmic CHR, like a little bit of like an urban pop song. But then because it was in Albanian, you know, we were getting these sort of ethnic elements and I was like, okay, I could put it in like a little ethno pop category. But now that it's in English, where are you kind of seeing this song land? Are you still thinking it's ethno pop? Are you kind of feeling like, no, this is like a, a pop song? What What are your thoughts on Albania's song now? I think there are more traditional elements, but I feel like the revamp sort of polished them a little. It's more of a proper pop song, so to speak, rather than something more traditional. I've also noticed the lyrics are a bit more standard, so to speak, or at least try to convey a more co at least a more standard mood rather than just try to tell a compelling story. I've noticed that when I listen to the revamp. Yeah, I I think the ethnic elements aren't as big in it. Like I will just say, just so it's clear. I actually prefer the first version of Albania of what they gave us. I'm I'm not a huge fan of this one and it it does leave me concerned for how Albania will fare like at this point now. I don't think it's going to advance, but I think part of why I think it'll not advance is because now they put themselves in a category where they're going to have so much direct competition. There's Denmark, there's Austria, there's Malta, um, there's Georgia. I just now at this point, I'm like, oof. And, you know, it, it'll just I think next to like an entry like Armenia's, even if you were trying to say, OK, well, there's still some ethnic pieces in Albania. Once you get Armenia's version, it's just like, oh, well, forget about it. We're you know, we're swimming in a sea of like stuff that feels more traditional. I'd also say Greece's entry is swimming in a sea of traditional. And so it just puts Albania in this position where I don't think it'll advance at this point. I feel like it's interesting you bring up Greece because I feel like Zari incorporates so many different things, and depending on in, in, depending on audience response, it could do really, really well. So that would result in in, in being left out in the cold. Zari has so much in terms of traditional elements, modern elements. You have Marina's vocals, so you have something really interesting going on. Whereas Armenia's with Jocko. It's very full on folk and it's very vibrant as a result. Yeah, I I just have to say, 
I love Armenia's entry. Okay, I just, I'm like, I just had to like say that like, it's just so joyful and it's so welcome on the playlist this year. Okay, you know, I've been talking a lot about what I've been calling the queer quartet. And, and I feel like these entries are giving us pop and I feel like they are in the same category and that's Sylvester Belt, that's Ali Alexander, that is um, a Nemo from Switzerland and Musti in Belgium. I feel like those four songs and entries are just all being compared because one, they're quality. I think all of them are quality entries. I think we all feel pretty confident that they're going to be executed well. Elda, in your opinion, who do you think is going to get the edge out of that group? Hmm. I feel like it's really interesting to talk about because they sort of convey the different pop form very well. With Dizzy, you have very electronic. It's very, he's a particular mood. It's really interesting. Look, Telic has a very more standard in a way and could get lost in the frenzy, but I could see enough appeal that it could swim through. With Before the Party is Over, I like the darkness in it per personally, and I think it definitely has elements to succeed, especially if you watch the music video. But at the same time, Belgium can sometimes miss with their staging, and I'd be kind of afraid of it if they get it wrong. Whereas with the code, it's definitely different from the rest of the four in that it has more experimental elements with the hip hop, with the drum and bass, with the operatic elements. It's a lot harder to tell a complete story on stage, but I have faith in Nemo and how they're going to convey their story live. Their vocals are really good, too. So you're saying Switzerland might come out on top. That's what you're thinking? If they manage to do it right, if they do it wrong, on the other hand, then it could easily explode, and not in a good way, because just because of all the different elements melched together. Lithuania seems like it's a safe choice, but it could be also be too safe. Yeah, I think I've heard like from different pockets of the fandom just that. Okay, I kind of want to focus a little bit on, you know, what are the songs we feel like we can't categorize this year? What are the songs that we feel like are maybe kind of occupying a space unto themselves? And I'll kick off. I'll say Ireland. I don't think there's any other bucket that we can really make a real comparison. I think Ireland's entry is sort of sitting in a plane unto itself. I think there's, yes, there's elements of pop. I would even say there's some like jazzy bits in some of the vocalizations. I think obviously we have some metal influences in there, but it all sort of cooks up into this soup that I feel like is really unique. Do you, do you agree with me? And do you think there's some other countries that are able to sort of occupy a space unto themselves? Ireland's definitely the first when I think about, and now for something completely different because of all the different influences, the different vocal techniques, it really blends together, but it's more of an acquired taste amongst people. There's probably a reason why Bambi Thug refers to their music as Oja Pop because it has so many different influences. I sometimes think Veronica could be on it to its own, not because it's more really out there, but it definitely has more art pop elements. And then you have the more classical inspired one from the strings to Raven's vocals near the end. So it could operate its own, but it could also fit into a stamp in the battle category, but it's only because it's relatively slower tempo than the average in the rest of the field. Yeah, I tend to agree with you there. I do think there's something about what Slovenia is giving that's, because the thing is, I in some ways I'm like, okay, Moldova's in the selection, you know, in that uh, semifinal. So will people maybe kind of compare these? Not quite, because I do think Moldova's entry is kind of giving that like electro pop 
sort of song, and I do feel like we've heard it before at Eurovision. But there is something about the structure of Raven's song where the chorus isn't necessarily like hitting you over the head in this very like accessible, catchy way. And so I think that that allows it to stand out. Here's another one. I feel like, you know, with the Czech Republic's entry, you know, Pedestal, yeah, it's rocky, but it's sort of giving us that like Olivia Rodrigo or Avril Lavigne for another era kind of like pop uh, pop rock feel. But I think what Megara is giving because they they got that band element sort of backing behind them. I actually think Megara is in a weird way occupying its own space. And I say that with the asterisks because I'm like, you know, I think Croatia's entry is fundamentally like a metal song, you know, like, I think people want to make it seem like it's super out of the box. But like, if you never saw the staging for it, and you were just listening to it, you know, you'd put this on the Detroit rock station, I think, and it would fit right in. But I do think with what Megara is giving is, is a little bit of different breed of metal. And I don't know if we have any direct comparisons this year. What are you thinking? It's interesting to see the very few rock entries re being represented at this year's. With Pedestal, I agree, definitely more pop punk. I definitely thought Olivia Rodrigo the first time I heard it. It's definitely more polished. So if Aiko could improve her vocals, she could have her own space. Definitely with Megara in Eleven Eleven, it's really interesting because you have full on metal and then you have the Spanish guitar interlude near the end. So you have that. And then you have Norway with Gote and Ulvaham, which is a mix of metal and folk with the traditional Norwegian instruments and lyrics based off Norwegian mythology. It's something you don't always get in the contest, but it's really interesting to see, especially from Norway. It's funny you brought up Norway because that was going to be the next country that I was like, I think Norway's occupying a space unto themselves. I think the only person I could maybe compare to them would be Slovenia's entry because we're getting sort of the ethnic mel uh, like melodies. I think we are getting some like, you know, somewhat traditional vocalizations on both part. But I do still see these as quite, quite different. different. You know, they're like cousins, maybe, if anything. But I don't think they're siblings. I don't think they're being raised in the same house. And so I do feel like Norway has the potential to just stand out based off the fact that it's like, yeah, I don't think we really are getting anything else quite like what Norway's serving. Definitely not. Even amongst the rock entries, it's definitely more distinct than you could say with Megara or Aiko. Yeah, and do you think that'll work to Norway's advantage or disadvantage? Hmm. Based on their qualification record and how long Gote has been in as a band, I have faith in them they'll not only qualify, but at least do decently. On the flip side, there's also the chance that the vocals might repel people because as we've seen before with more traditional influence influence songs it could be a turn off if people don't approach it the right way yeah i i wanted to sort of pivot us a little bit because i don't think we talked about it explicitly but clearly you know electronic music influence is very prominent at the Eurovision Song Contest. And, you know, we haven't talked about like Poland and Australia, which to me are very clearly like electro pop songs like that I would kind of put in that category. They sound different, but I, I do feel like they both give a little bit of a sense of like, I was making this on GarageBand, like in the best way, like where it feels sort of like, like there's a rawness to it. Um, which I think sometimes can lend itself well on the Eurovision stage, because then when you see it live, it, the sound is fuller. Obviously, I think Poland has a little bit more of a fuller sound than Australia's entry. But again, I think sometimes with those electro pop songs, that can maybe sometimes feel a little bit hollow or thin um, in a studio cut experience, really have the opportunity to pop live because you're kind of adding in that soundtrack of the crowd who's watching it live i don't know are there any other songs that you feel like 
Okay, we haven't really touched on and you just have to speak on. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the tower and one blood from Australia because what I've noticed is that the tower is a bit more polished in terms of production and what you're going for, whereas in Australia, the Australian entry has more traditional elements and considering Electric Field's experience with staging, you could see a definite moment for them if they get it right. As for anything that hasn't been mentioned, hmm. I know earlier mentioned Croatia as possible rock entry. I think it's more of a mishmash of that electronic. And I see it in the yeah. same realm as the Netherlands or Finland, just because of how really energetic they are. Yeah, I could see it sort of in the same realm as Finland, but I do think the distinct difference between Croatia and the Netherlands is the Netherlands is like, I wouldn't even necessarily call it rock. Like to me, this is Euro pop. Like the Euro Papa song is at its core, giving us that like Euro dance pop that so many of us like grew up with like that sound. And I think with Croatia, you know, they're sort of hanging their hat on that root of just metal, like of rock. Um, and I think that that's actually a good thing because I think it allows both of those entries to give people somewhat of a contrast where it's like if someone was like, oh, man, I love both of these. But like, you know, the Eurodance thing, I just I'm so nostalgic for it. So I might sway this way or like, no, like I loved when Monaskin won. This is not the Euro pop song contest let's give rock another like moment and you could kind of lean more towards that way a country we haven't talked about that i actually am now like they might be standing on a plane unto themselves a little bit is Pula. estonia's entry which is it's rock it's ethnic there are there's traditional instrumentation it's not in english I mean, as many like, oh, it's fun, it's party, like out of the box songs we have. I do think Estonia is doing the like, it's fun ethnic thing really well. Because the thing with Croatia's is it's ethnic, I think, because of kind of the contents of the song, like what he's actually talking about. And because of some of the, the styling choices they've done and what we're seeing visually. But I think if you closed your eyes and you just heard this in a studio cut, you might not necessarily think of it as anything ethnic per se, unless you were really following the lyrics. But with Estonia's, I mean, this is Estonian. This is ethnic, but it's also fun and it's also kind of a hodgepodge. What do you think of what Estonia is giving us this year, Elda? Definitely one of those, and now for something completely different. They're a mishmash of hip hop from one band and traditional from another with the tall harpa. It's its own thing entirely, and it's very intriguing to see how it'll translate. His yeah, I'm. Is- yeah, I'm curious to see how this does with the televote. I I have seen both sides. I've seen people who are like, oh, psh, like Estonia is definitely making it, and I've seen people like, eh, I don't know, like. They might just miss out, like people might just, you know, kind of pick the other fun thing. I think I'm living in the world where it makes it. I'm living in the world where it makes it, but I will say, I don't love how they staged this at the national selection. And I almost wish they just went more with the visuals from the music video, because I think if they did the visuals from the music video, then no one could deny the fact that this would advance to the final. I don't know. What do you think? That's an interesting thing because I know it's a hit in Estonia and the people were really into it, but I'm not sure how it would translate to the broader European public and now the rest of the world. I think it does have potential, but it depends on how you can tell the story of the song without looking too messy. Yeah, I do think they need to perhaps rethink some of that staging. I don't know if they will. But we'll see. And I mean, really, the choice is yours. Do you want to be in the final or do you not want to be in the final? Okay, I want to start to bring our conversation a little bit to a close. And Elda, I just wanted to ask, 
you know, are there any songs that you kind of feel, or I shouldn't say songs, but genres that you feel like just tend to not do well at Eurovision? If you're at a songwriting camp and this country wants to win, is there a genre that you would say, hey, you know, I don't know if you want to go down that route if you're trying to win? I feel like it's harder to have a more hip hop or R&B song with it all. Sure, you have Soldi coming close to 2019 and Stefania w- winning, but I feel like the latter is more abnormal circumstances to it. And it de- generally, it would be a bit harder to win with full on rap rather than just pop or electronic and such. Full on folk is pretty hard to execute well. Ethno pop is well known, as you've seen through mid 2000s winners and sometimes in the 2000s teens, but. Something like AIA would be a lot harder to rise to the top just because some people will get it and some people will not get it. It's interesting you kind of brought those. I figured you would say, yeah, like the hip hop R&B ones because we just haven't quite seen that win Eurovision yet in a real way. But I, I'm going to throw this out there as someone who is a deep fan of this genre and I want to see it get its due at some point, and that's Popra. I was a heavy Il Volo fan in 2015. My heart was slightly broken for them. I was happy for Mon Semelov and just Sweden, but I was, my heart was broken. And I mean, there are so many Popra Eurovision entries. I'm just going to throw out there, Cesar, Romania, It's My Life. I, I would love to have a popera moment. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, though. But I would love to see it happen. I remember Zero Gravity a few years ago. Yep, just, yep. And that sort of elevated by the staging and sort of conveys the story of the song really well. An obscure favorite of mine from that popera genre is Sved Seyuga, Slovenia 2007. Yeah. I feel, I feel like it incorporates a lot of Balkan elements and Alenka sings this really well, and you have a very pretty staging. Yeah, so we're we're gonna resurrect these genres. We're we're definitely gonna make it happen. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me, Elda. Thank you to everyone who is listening to the Eurovision for Real podcast. If you haven't already decided to follow and subscribe to this podcast, what are you waiting for? If you love Eurovision, this is the podcast for you. And don't forget, if you are ready for some Eurovision content that isn't just giving you news, but is sort of sparking your thinking, sparking conversations you might want to have with other Eurovision fans or casual viewers alike don't forget to check out eurovisionfam.com that's f-a-m short for family.com thank you so much for listening